Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Can you hear me in the back? Uh, I'd like to thank my father-in-law, Dr. James R. Jews, for being here. It uh, helps you. <laughs> and Tom for reading my article and actually thinking it would be of interest to you. And uh, compliment you on the work that you do in the Reynolds Middle School. Uh, I actually went there and did what we call a field assessment of the operation and the capacity, and I can tell you it's a pretty good operation. Um, my experience is on the origin end of refugee populations. I've done some work in the States with uh, refugee resettlement and things like that, but I'm really more overseas where, where these people are coming from. Um, and I've been thinking about doing business in risky environments for decades. I've been thinking specifically about Syria since last summer uh, when I was working in Beirut, Lebanon, remote managing uh, an assistance program for international Orthodox Christian charities right, in Syria. It's a program that is run through the largest Christian church in Syria, the Orthodox Patriarchate of Antioch and all the East, right, which was founded by the Apostle St. Peter in 34 AD. Um, currently, the Orthodox Christian community in Syria numbers about 140,000. That's the first church that Peter offered Christian services in. Now, Lebanon was a really interesting vantage point for this because it's uh, relatively stable and peaceful and prosperous, uh, but 15 years ago it ended a 15-year civil war. And so the similarities between what Lebanon is experiencing and what Syria is experiencing is uh, very, very strong. Um, there's a notable fact that I want just on a side here. 13 years into the Lebanese civil war, the Lebanese pound collapsed as a currency. They were able to fight the war for 15 years without losing the value of their currency. And you'll see why I'm talking a lot about how uh, war and peace are not separate categories. They're kind of a blend. Reading articles in the Lebanese press uh, about businesses waiting for years, impatiently, waiting impatiently, but for years for the Syrian reconstruction era to open up and articles about how, whether they should invest in the port to uh, develop the capacity for the type of uh, flow for construction material and equipment, et cetera, that would go through the port of Beirut into, into Syria. Uh, this is something that the uh, Lebanese have a lot of experience with, reconstructing. And uh, these are actually pictures from their airport, the Harari airport. I used to walk to work, and this is a pothole, and that's the barrier to tell you not to drive into the pothole, and they put it in the pothole, and for the 90 days, that was the solution. Right? It's hard to reconstruct something past a certain point when you still have the Civil War in the background, and so your politics and your economics are something you have to pay attention to. On to Syria. After six years, 10 months, and today 13 days, the civil war is winding down. And the winner is the Assad regime. Uh, the Assad regime, it's a one party state, it's a secret police state. Its roots in the design of the actual regi regime itself, the structure of the authority, are based in the design of Nazi and Soviet regimes. Um, it is a regime unlike Vietnam that cannot reform itself, right? Because 
It is also the vehicle for the minority community that dominates the government, the military, the secret police forces, and the economy. It's an offshoot of the Shia community. It's called Alawite. The Alawite community dominates this state, right? Um, it's the vehicle for them to survive, right, in what is actually the lion's den of Syrian communities. Notable fact, it destroyed almost anything and everything. And it can cost a lot of money to put it back together again. You can debate whether or not the fear that these communities have for each other is a never-ending reality, which will never escape, or just an unfortunate perception, right, that we could get past. But the fact is that in our lifetime, Syrian politics are perceived as a winner-takes-all game. And when the Berlin Wall fell, these post-Soviet regimes that all have the same thing, Cambodia, Serbia, you name it, um, they all had to figure out how to accommodate themselves in the modern world without the Soviet Union in it. So European Union, capitalism, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Bashar al-Assad, at a particular point in time, you can listen to his speech, decided not to do it. Um, they chose not, basically, to lose. That they weren't going to do anything that Gorbachev had done. They weren't going to risk the, the regime or their dominance on anything for anybody, and they decided not to lose. Right? Um, they didn't have much of a plan beyond that. They had, didn't have one in the first place. They don't have one. They didn't have one then. They don't have one now. Uh, but they were not going to go to the way of Saddam's Tikriti supporters, the Sunni supporters of Saddam, which they just witnessed. Uh, Syrian politics are played according, according to things called Hama rules. It's an expression that Thomas Friedman put up. And basically, under the current Assad's father, Hafez al-Assad, who ran the place for 40 years, right, there was a similar uprising of the same Sunni community in the town of Hama. Uh, he surrounded the town with artillery units, pummeled it, and then he drove tank divisions across it. Right, the number of people killed anywhere between 1,000, 10,000, 20,000, depending on who you ask. Right? But Hama rules established how the game in Syria is played. That's the rules. You want to challenge this? This is what you're up against. So what's the outcome? Right? It's definitely not a shift of Syria into the US and European Union column right, of democratic market economies. Uh, Syria will certainly stay in the Russian column of police states and oligarchies, which is what replaced any type of communist ideology, police state and oligarchy. But it's also a victory or a win for China via Iran. The Chinese, it's expensive to ship something by air to the European market. Right? But if you have to get a product somewhere fast, you ship it by air. It's inexpensive to ship it by sea, but you can design a computer program or a computer or a style of clothing or whatever it is, and by the time it gets to the European market by sea, it's outmoded, it's outdated. Right? So they are building a road with one and a half trillion dollar investment from China to Europe along what used to be the, the great Silk Road of ancient history. Right? It's a railroad. And it's quite advanced in construction. Uh, so Russia's going to keep its satellite, and it's going to sell a lot of arms, which is what it's been doing. Right? They've been demonstrating the uh, success of their arms in conflict in Syria uh, as a marketing effort to anybody else who would like to buy Russian arms. And there's a whole crowd of people lining up right, to buy these things. Um, the Iranian and Turkish companies that are involved in construction, and Turkey has a wonderful sector of internationally active, medium-sized construction companies. Right? 
They will be involved in the construction part of reconstruction in Syria. And China is going to build whatever transport, transportation infrastructure suits its own interests. And it's going to be pretty big stuff. The engines for the, for the uh, trains that run on the Great Silk Road right, were built in Erie, Pennsylvania, by the way. Footnote. As I say, uh, sad statement when you actually think about it. To the winner goes the spoils. But not to worry. On slide six, I pointed out the $250 billion tab for this insane war that they've had for six years. Nobody knows where the money's going to come from. Russians don't have it. Iranians and Turks don't have it. We're certainly not going to pony up. Why would the UN do it? Right? Maybe China, but they'll only spend on what is going to help them in terms of their, their infrastructure idea. So this regime is only going to grow an economy that suits its personal income interests, just like before. Uh, we're not looking at Syria building a modern economy with everybody getting involved in prospering. I mean, if they wanted to do that, they could have skipped the Civil War and just got down to, to, to governing well. So after six years of war, the Assad regime isn't going to suddenly embrace Gorbachev's ideas because that caused the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was their major ally. So perestroika, glasnost, all this thinking about reforming this regime, no. They're going to stick to Putin, the guy who has been putting that system back together again in Russia. So that's the big geopolitical picture. Sure, I have to fix this. And it's also the big picture for big contracts, like Halliburton size contracts or Exxon size contracts. Right? I'd like to shift to uh, something that's closer to our hearts as smaller business people and as charitable people. Um, and our government is involved in, in engaged with the population that spilled out of Syria and is uh, displaced within Syria. Uh, so our tax money is involved uh, in that aspect of, of the humanitarian response to, to the crisis. Um, and it's notable, I think, uh, that I don't think the regime will be in any hurry to welcome these people back. I'd like to clear some rubble first in how we think about these things. Because uh, we, we have some common categories that we use when we look at a foreign crisis, and they're not true. Uh, war and peace, we consider them to be two separate states of affairs, right? And politics and economics, we talk politics over here, then we go talk economics over there. Right? Uh, but in fact, they're really not separate. I'm going to use an example rather than belabor the point. Right? This is an article that appeared recently. Right? You have a military force, a mercenary military force, right? employed by a private Russian company that is currying favor with the current government of Syria to secure a long-term economic interest right, by taking over territory from ISIS, ISIS that includes an oil field and an oil refinery. And if this Russian company and its mercenaries do the job of taking this territory from ISIS, they get a long-term lease on the refinery. Now, where does the separation of war and peace and politics and economics land in a story like that? And the whole thing is like that. <laughs> I 
So anybody who's actually waiting for peace in order to do business, right, you already missed the boat. The race has already started. But the implication of throwing away these ideas that war and peace are two separate things and politics and economics are two separate things, it, it goes deeper than just companies missing a boat on a, on a business opportunity. And, you know, $250 billion being spent to reconstruct a country is a lot of money, right? And it brings us back to the Syrian civil war and how one combats the war. And I hate to use a military term, but you can fight in a war or you can fight the war itself. Humanitarian assistance is pretty much the job of fighting against the war or dealing with the consequences of it, refugee flows that land, end up here. I want to make a long story short here. Let's say that civil war is less about what things people say about it and more about who has what and who gets what. Uh, the difference between civil war and peace then is that in war everything is up for grabs. And in peace you have a winner for a moment and it could be a long historical moment, but in peace you have a winner that enforces what we call the monopoly of force, that makes people play by certain rules, right? You can't just go and shoot people and take their stuff, right? Everybody else gets to enjoy the stuff that they have, right? So war might be the natural condition, particularly the place in the Middle East where everybody has so many conflicts, and you only get the chance to do something like we do in this country, building on peace, having a civil society, having the Rotary Club. You only get a chance to do that when you don't have a civil war. Now, in this sense, in this minimal sense, peace is civil war one. Right? You can build a lot on that, like we do, but tyrannies, police states like Syria and North Korea, their tyrannies, right? They're not interested in the prosperity for their population. They're not interested in building civil society. They're not interested in much beyond their own particular self-interest, and it's pretty small. If you go to Saddam's palaces, they're chintzy, cheesy. Huh? All for what? Keep a whole generation in slavery, right, so that you can have what? It's ridiculous stuff. Um, if you want to build on top of the absence of civil war, you have to have private property and the rule of law. You know that, you have to respect stuff. It's not for nothing that dictatorships like this are corrupt to the core. They are basically the rule of somebody who controls everything and lets you have some of it but can take it from you. No rule of law, no private property. A guy who can tell you whether or not you're gonna have something in your life. Dictators, like Darth Vader's from Star Wars going to the dark side, right? Build power on weakening and impoverishing their people. Weakened and impoverished, you have no choice but to support the dictatorship. Dictatorships are against prosperity. They're not just incapable of it, we fault them for not governing well, they're against it. During the 1990s, the father of today's Kim Jong-un in North Korea let a half a million North Koreans starve to death, right, without blinking an eye and being reluctant to accept humanitarian assistance. Doesn't care, not part of their game plan. And now he's got a huge army. One of the reasons he has a huge army is that it's the only place in North Korea you can get three hots in a cot, right? Roof over your head and fed. I'm serious about you. Now the chart you've been looking at contrasts the amount of money that the world spends every year on the military component of national security to how much the species, us, spend on the human component 
of national security. Big difference. Now, I'm going to kind of skip a rock over some of this because I want to get somewhere else. Right? These are the economic sectors that recover earliest after a disaster. Civil war, tsunami, you name it. Right? Um, you guys will probably have businesses in some of these sectors. Now, the next couple of slides are really only fun for people who know a lot about the humanitarian assistance sector as a business sector. So I'm going to kind of skip over them, but you have to understand this, right? These are going to be the categories by which assistance money flows from funding agencies like the U.S. government or the U.N. or whatever it is through the system down to people who are helped by projects. For instance, the USAID's Office of Refugee Resettlement, ORR, is the funding agency for the Reynolds Middle School program. Right? And it's defined as refugees. When I was in Iraq in 2003, 2004, the United States government had allocated a tremendous amount of money to help uh, refugees in Iraq, in, in Iraq that would result from the war. There were no refugees. They didn't cross a border. They were internally displaced people because everybody got kicked out of their house, but they all stayed within the Iraqi borders. If they had crossed the border into Iran, they would become a refugee, technical term. For one year, while the insurgency rose up to its full-throated force, we were trying to reallocate the money so that it could be spent by agencies on internally displaced people. Right? So for a year, it just stutter stop because of the categories. So this is important stuff when you get it wrong. And I'm going to suggest in the end, that you guys can help get it right. What matters specifically for us today, right, is whether or not displaced people and refugees, Syria has a lot of them, right, can actually get in a smooth way from receiving relief assistance, food and medical kits when you're kicked out of your house and you don't know where you're going to go, right, to getting livelihoods, what's called livelihoods aid, which is to help you have an income, right? to then getting economic development assistance, right? Three different categories of humanitarian programming, three different categories of funding, different funding agencies, different organizations that do this type of work. Is our system, our world system, and we've spent a lot of money on this, so let's, let's take this seriously. Is our system, if you look at it from the point of view of an individual Iraqi displaced person or Syrian refugee, right, does it serve you? I mean, you get a number when you get kicked out of your house. Do you get some food while you're on the road? Are you settled someplace in a camp where, where somebody can actually make you, you know, give you a, a sewing machine so that you can earn something instead of just sit there? And do you get to go back to your country and under what conditions, what kind of housing you have, right? From that perspective of that person, that refugee person, is this a seamless series of people helping me? And no, it's not. It's too complicated at the top, but it doesn't, it doesn't follow through on the bottom. Um, businesses can play a role in this, and that's what I'm going to try to isolate here. Right? By the way, is there anybody here from MEDA, Mennonite Economic Development Association, MCC, Mennonite Central Committee? Oh, shucks. MEDA is a good organization. MEDA is an interesting organization from my point of view. Um, their idea about building business solutions to poverty, just very direct. You help poor people make money. Hmm? Right? I'm kind of banking off of that and saying that if you want to help refugees and displaced people, you have to help them keep or regain some sort of livelihood, right? Not later, but now, during the war, because the war is about taking that away from them. Look at it from Assad's point of view. He's kicked 5.5 million people out of his country, and he's not going to let them back in. 
He's got six million people in the country who are beholden to him for access to, to food and electricity. Why would he give up that power over these people? That's what these guys do. These are examples of livelihood programming. You've never heard of it before, right? And I think just the example, if, if somebody was a, uh, a shoe manufacturer, right, and their place is bombed and they've run down the road to some other place like that, putting them back in some sort of shoe-related activity is a good thing to do early in the conflict so that while they're in the refugee camp, they can, they can make some money. So maybe it's just a, a, a machine that helps them repair shoes. Your idea is that one day he's going to rebuild his factory and employ a bunch of people, right? But you don't make him sit as a refugee with nothing to do for four years because that's the condition that our enemies want these people in and it deliberately created so that they're in that. So struggling against this type of regime is not just combating it with arms, but also combating it with prosperity. This is how agencies like UNHCR or say the Twilight Baba, people who run the refugee programs and the refugee camps, these are their categories of programming that they'll fund. Right? This type of stuff they do now before what they call the early recovery stage. Right? Livelihoods only is allowed after the war has stopped and early recovery is there and you can now spend on livelihoods. I'm arguing that you should spend, you should defend people's livelihoods from the get-go all the time, as opposed to, to segregating it with these categories, which aren't real. And again, a business person would understand this. Sending somebody to sit in a corner for three years and then helping him, right, is not a good idea. I mean, maybe you help him a little bit now, but you do help him now, right, to be a business person. Let's just pause for a second to talk about, about some facts about refugees. Right? The Syrian population, about 18 million, 5.5, population of Minnesota, right, refugees, i.e., they were kicked off across the border. Uh, 6 million, the population of Wisconsin, right, displaced inside the country. So if you take all the Vikings, Viking fans and Green Bay Packer fans and all the families and all the friends around them that don't pay attention to football, you take all those people, right, that's the size of this displaced consumer market and labor that used to be employed somehow, right? Uh, let's put it in context here. Lebanon has 4.4 million people, 1 million refugees. It's 23% of the people in Lebanon, right, are refugees. For us, you would have to have 73 million Syrian refugees to carry the same burden, right? That is taking the population of Pennsylvania into the country once, twice, three times, four times, five times, six times. It's huge. We've actually accommodated 12.4 in 2016, 12,000. Some people call that a problem, right? Some people call it not my problem. It's actually a huge market. If you gather up all the people from this, in this circumstance across the world at any point in time, we have 65 million people who are stateless, displaced or across the border. 65 million people, it's the size of France or, 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 or the UK. You can reach these people working indirectly. You don't have to go straight to them. There are 40,000 non-governmental organizations, NGOs, that are working with them. 400 American NGOs, right? They buy stuff, right, to be used by these people under certain circumstances. Uh, my first job in this is the stuff I did uh, purchasing for programs in uh, Zaire many, many years ago. And Lancaster was the only place I could find some equipment that wasn't computerized, didn't require electronics, that type of stuff, to buy an anvil, not very easy, right? Lancaster has a sense of technology, appropriate technology, that most of the country doesn't, doesn't have anymore. Amish, uh, uh, well, hydraulics, right, are a fantastic thing in the third world, right? Uh, the modern refugee camp is designed 
to accommodate people and to accommodate their livelihood needs. And I can tell you about what happened in Afghanistan, but you know about it because we didn't do this in Afghanistan. We raised a generation of terrorists. Right? You can't put people in these camps for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, right? have life be really horrible, and then not expect some consequences. So it behooves us to actually do this right. It's cheaper to do this right. Just take another 1% of your defense budget and spend it in the right place. It's easy to get connected to this type of stuff. Um, I can talk for just a second more. Right? Right? Um, you have to have appropriate technology. You probably have it in your older versions of stuff. right? It has to be relatively portable. It has to be the basis of a long-term investment in a certain activity, like what do you start, how do you start a shoe factory based on something you can carry and set down and repair a shoe with. Um, the Syria conflict is completely digitalized. Everybody's got a, got a phone, right? Uh, everybody's got a bank account, right? You can connect with these people on a business thing. Humanitarian assistance is, is moving in the direction of, of giving people money through their phone as opposed to sending them stuff. Highly digital. I won't go on about that, but it's quite easy to look at refugees who used to own a business, right, as a business partner. And it's actually the cheapest way I can think of to position yourself to enter what could be a very good market over five or ten years. As from a business point of view, riding the coattails of humanitarian assistance into a country, uh, it's good for you, for your heart, Matthew 25, right? It's also good business. It's longer term business than we're used to. But hey, you know, good things take a while. Right. I'll just stop there because questions and answers are too much fun. <laughs> <laughs>